Welcome to the audience participation part of the, uh, the SEND Symposium. So this is our uh, second annual uh, drug target competition for neglected diseases. And uh, for those of you that don't know what's about to happen, uh, we solicited proposals from the Stanford, UCSD, UCSF, Berkeley community to, uh, for people to propose uh, targets to be screened uh, for small molecule inhibitors. And the screen is going to happen at the Small Molecule Discovery Center at UCSF. Um, <clears throat> our panel of judges has uh, read out, it turned out this year, a, a set of very outstanding proposals and picked three uh, as the short list for presentation to you, the, the audience. And so what we're going to do today is hear about the winner from last year, Edgar Sandoval, is going to present the results of his screen during the last year of a malarial dipeptidase. And that's going to set the bar. OK? <clears throat> and, um, and then we'll hear uh, talks from the three groups. Um, and they're going to try to convince you that their target is the best one to be screened this year. And um, right, and then at the end of that, you get to vote. And the judges, who I'll introduce to you in a second, um, <clears throat> uh, will be taken to a secret location to uh, deliberate on the, on the presentations and the worthiness of the targets. And they'll be informed of your vote. But they don't have to do what you say. OK? And they're going to then come back, pick the winner. The winner is going to be awarded the screen at the SMDC. Um, and, and then they'll tell us about why they picked um, the, the target that they picked. And of course, this is uh, an exercise in uh, something wonderful, which is actually making a, a, a set of useful inhibitors to study neglected diseases. But also, we get to learn from our blue ribbon panel of judges, what it is that makes for a good uh, drug target. And that's something that in, in academia we don't necessarily get exposed to uh, very frequently. So first let me introduce the judges and then I'll hand it over to Edgar. <clears throat> the great thing about our judges this year, they come from the venture capital and biotech communities in the San Francisco Bay Area. They all have um, ties to Berkeley, all right? We have uh, David Mack here, Alta Partners, Berkeley 84. <clears throat> I can't believe that, David. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see your driver's license after this. Andy Tomasi, Berkeley 80, 93, sorry. 93, also at Alta Partners. This is a venture capital firm that has investments in many uh, biotech companies uh, in the Bay Area and beyond. And so they see proposals all, all the time, every day. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. Right. So this is they're used to picking. And Gideon Boleg, Berkeley 89, uh, graduate of Dan Koshland's lab. He's the uh, VP for research at a very successful uh, biotech startup in Berkeley called Plexicon. So these are our judges and, uh, founded by <coughs> sorry? Founded by Alta. Founded by Alta. Okay. Small exactly. Berkeley and Alta, everything comes back to that. So I'll start with Edgar Sandoval. <coughs> He's a postdoc in Matt Bogia's lab. He was the winner of last year's competition. And he'll tell us about how his screen of the malarial dipeptidase went at the SMDC. Thank you, Edgar. It's a great pleasure to be back here in Berkeley. Actually, I got my PhD here in Jack Kirsch lab. And this place brings a lot of good memories to me, especially I started my career as a biochemist, probably where the back of that room here is that used to be where Jack Lab used to be in the old Stanley Hall. So really, I did my first protein purification and enzymatic assay in this building. 
So what I'm going to talk to you basically is what our results have been so far with the high throughput screening of, of compounds against uh, dipeptide peptidase 1. I want, really want to thank the CND to organize that competition and allow me to get that amazing experience in doing a high throughput screening. And right front, I want to thank uh, Ken Yang and Stephen at the SMDC, which were really amazing to, to work with. Uh, Kenny helped me throughout all the screening process and teach me how to use all the machines. And see what making sure that all the machines were running smoothly and really put a lot of effort in trying to get as much step as possible to get automated. So I, did, I had to do less work. So why do we care about malaria? As everybody in this room knows, it's one of the major infectious diseases. Because one to three million people every year, uh, half of the world population is at risk. And there's about a quarter of a billion ca clinical cases every year. But the most dramatic aspect is the wide press resistance of the parasites to or frontline drugs. The last available frontline drug is artemisin, and the first sign of artemisin resistance are now appearing in uh, Southeast Asia. So there is a real uh, urgency to develop new antimalarial drugs. So Ireland, I'm first going to talk to where I left last year, which is basically uh, why we think DEEP has a good drug target for malaria. Then I will describe the assay and which compounds we took to do cherry pick, and then what I'm doing right now, which is the triage process, which we hope to come up with a subset of between 5 and 15 compounds to do follow-up studies. So malaria is a very complicated life cycle. It, uh, circulates between the mosquito host and the human host. In the mosquito host, it uh, made sexually and reproduced sexually. And in the human host, uh, infections start with sporozoids, a uh, form of the parasite traveling to the liver and infect their liver cells. There, they multiply and form about 1,000 merozoids, which are the form of the parasite that's able to invade red blood cells. And in the lab, we're really focusing on the role of proteases in that blood stages. This is a 48-hour synchronous cycle that starts with a merozoid divides a red blood cell, forming what is known as the ring stage. The parasite then starts to grow and replicate its DNA, which is the trophosome stage. And then the uh, 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 DNA segregates into individual uh, parasites, which is the schizome state. And when those parasites are mature, the schizome bursts, releasing merozoid that can start another round of infection. And all the parasites inside a human host are synchronous. And that bursting event is what uh, causes all the manifestation of the disease, like the shivers, the high fevers that recur every other day. So cysteine proteases are involved in all the stages of that blood uh, stages. And especially DEPA, we thought they were really interesting because they're involved at two crusher steps. DEPA1 was identified by Michael Klembel as a involved in hemoglobin degradation, which is the main source of amino acid for the parasite. And Shirin, a previous postdoc in the lab, identified DEPA3 as a key regulator or raptor. So if you take schizons and treat them with a DEPA3 inhibitor, they cannot burst. They get stuck into that form. So we thought we find molecules able to inhibit DEPA1 and DEPA3 will be attacking the parasite at two very different stages of its life cycle. And I just want you to keep in mind that falcipanes are also cysteine proteases of the same family that are also involved in hemoglobin degradation and have, have been pursued for several years as potential drug targets. So the other reason why we think DPAS might be a, a good drug target is because uh, those proteases differ from other general endopeptides in that they only cleave two amino acids off the N-terminal or substrate. So the active site is relatively small, and we think it might be easier to block it with small molecules. And finally, David Percival recently published a paper showing that cathepsin C, which is the closest homologs in mammal to those DPAPs, can be inhibited in rats for several weeks without seeing any toxic effect. So really, the difficulty, since it's really hard to do genetics in malaria, was to prove that DPAP1 is actually a target. So our approach was to design specific DPAP1 inhibitors and show that those can actually kill parasites. And I'm going to introduce you to a technology that was mainly developed in a lab. So the way we measure whether an inhibitor is specific for a given protease, we use activity-based probes. And this FY1 is the probe we use to measure DPAP uh, activity. 
So it's composed of a peptidic region which will target the protease, the probe to a specific protease, a warhead which will be covalently attached to the catalytic cysteine of uh, cysteine protease. And then through a linking, we attach a tag, in this case a fluorescent tag, so we can actually visualize in a gel by size the activity of the EPA bond. And this compound we got from David Percival, American, he was developed as a, as a cathepsin C inhibitor, turned out to be a really specific inhibitor in the parasites for DPAP1. So it's a covalent inhibitor with a diazomethyl ketone warhead. And if we treat parasite lysate, pre-treat parasite lysate with that compound and then add the probe, you can see we don't see any more labeling of DPAP1 showing it's a good inhibitor of DPAP1. We use DCGO4, uh, which is a probe for the falcipanes. We don't see inhibition of falcipane 2 or 3 or falcipane 1, neither inhibition of DPAP3, which shows up as three distinct bands in merozoic lysase. So that compound is to be fairly specific for DPAP1. Moreover, if you do a dose response, so here is treating parasite lysate for different amount of time, between five minutes and two hours, a different concentration of inhibitors. You can see the IC50 decreases which is what you expect for a covalent inhibitor. And the IC50 after two hours is about two nanomolar, and that matches the concentration you need of that compound to actually kill uh, plasmodium falciparum in culture. So our main part was not really to get good DPAP inhibitors, but to get inhibitors that will work in, in vivo in mouse models. And what we found is all those peptidic inhibitors are really poor PK properties. They're not stable enough. So with a high throughput screening approach, will allow us to identify new scaffolds of inhibitors that might have better uh, PK properties. The problem is that we didn't have any recombinant DPAP1, and I didn't want to spend months in the cold room trying to purify enough amounts of DPAP1 to actually do a high throughput screening. But we had DPAP1 inhibitors, so our approach was to find a substrate that gets turned over fairly well in parasite lysis, but get very little turnover if we inhibit uh, DPAP1 with an inhibitor. And so we knew from our specificity studies that the proline followed by an arginine will make a really good substrate for, for DPAPs. And then we designed this, in, uh, this substrate with a rhodamine group, especially to do the high throughput screening. It gets cleaved twice, releasing two peptides, proline arginine peptides, and this rhodamine uh, fluorophore emits at 523 nanometers. And we use that uh, fluorophore because the higher you go into emission, then the less likely you're going to get background from the intrinsic uh, fluorescence of a large library of compounds. So that's the dose response with parasite lysate. We get a good linear range between 0 and 20 micromolar with an apparent KM of 10 micromolar, which is what we use for the screen. And we tried that assay, OK, to prove that that assay was really specific for DPAP1. What we can use is treat parasite lysate with increasing concentrations of probe. You can see here a probe is really clean. It only labels DPAP1. And we're trying to correlate whether that labeling correlates to the decrease in substrate turnover. And we get almost a perfect correlation, meaning that most of the activity of turnover of that substrate comes from DPAP1. So we tried that assay in a 384 well plate. We used only 20 microliter of uh, reaction. And what you can see, we got a signal to noise between DMSO treated lysates and DPAP1 inhibitor treated lysate of about 300, with a Z score very close to one. So I throughput screen, I learned it's all about the Z prime score. So the closest uh, Z prime score of one is basically a perfect score. Anything about 0.5 is good for high throughput screening. So how did we actually physically run the assay at the SMDC? So take a stack of assay plates. We deliver one microliter of compound. Find a concentration be 10 micromolar. Then add 10 microliters of substrate. And then add 10 microliters of lysis. And let the reaction go for about 50 minutes. And then we quench the reaction with acetic acid. The reaction stops, and the signal we check is stable for several hours, and so we have time to read the plate. So we screen more than 100,000 small molecules in more than 300 plates. And what you can see here in blue is like 100% inhibition. Those are positive controls. In green, it's hard to see, but basically those are the DMSO controls. And in each plate, we have about 
32 positive controls and 32 negative controls, so we can get a Z prime for each plate. And I will, what I have here is basically most of the plates have a Z prime above 0.5. There's only three that show a low Z prime, but most of them are above 0.8. So this assay is really robust for high throughput screening. And basically everything about three standard deviation is a significant hit. And we got about 1,000 compounds that actually significantly inhibit DPA1. But we decided just to take the top 230, which inhibit more than 50% of the activity of 10 micromolar. So that's the process. I'm in the product triage, so we want to do a lot of things with those 227 here. The first thing we, have, we want to do is to validate them as DPA1 uh, inhibitors. And for that, we do a dose response between 20 nanomolar and 50 micromolar and see if we get a nice dose response that would validate those that real DPAP-1 inhibitors. But at the same time, Kenny has been running uh, falcipine assays in a high throughput uh, fashion, and falcipines are also cysteine proteases of the same family. So we decided at the same time to also do dose response for both falcipine 2 and falcipine 3. Uh, the other thing we wanted to do is if any of those compounds actually have any effect in the replication of, of parasites, whether they can kill the parasites. So it does some replication assay, and finally we did like a reprogress assay that we've used in the lab previously to identify DPAP3 inhibitors. So I mean, I just got most of the data in the last three weeks. Okay. So I'm gonna go through it and the first thing in terms of dose response, like of the 227, we find 88 false positives, meaning that they didn't show any inhibition even at 50 micromolar. But we found 140, which we can fit an IC50, and we see all, all range going from 20 nanomolar up to 300 uh, micromolar. And we also identified some falcipane inhibitors, but they had a much higher IC50. I just want to point out that uh, 19 of those compounds were able to inhibit the three enzymes, and, but most of them were DPAP1 selective hits. So we have identified some real DPAP1 inhibitors. Also, some of them hit the falcipanes, but are any of those uh, compounds have any effect in, in culture? So standard replication assay was to take cultures at drink stage, treat them with one micromolar of compound, and then wait one and a half cycle. So 72 hours, by that point, we reach a Schizen stage in which the parasite has already replicated its DNA multiple times. So it's very convenient just to stain the, the DNA and the fax analysis, the red blood cells don't have DNA. So they have very low fluorescence compared to the Schizen that have a lot of parasites in them. And that's a positive control of an inhibitor that kills a parasite. You can see a real decrease in, in, in Schizen. That assay has a good uh, Z prime, and we, could, we were able to use that assay to basically screen those, those 227 uh, compounds. We find only 11 compounds that significantly decrease parasitemia. Everything below 0.8 is a significant decrease, and only six of those uh, we were, uh, were confirmed DPA1 hits that show a dose response. So we're, ex we're hoping to see more hits in this assay, but you have to. Uh, keep in mind, our initial screen was done at 10 micromolar, and we did that one at one micromolar. So issues with permeability, the compound has to cross four membranes actually to reach its target because DPA1 is in, the, in a specific organelle in the parasite. Might explain that, or some uh, uh, stability issues might also explain why we got so few hits. In the meantime, while I was doing that assay, I also set up the Raptor assay in which you take Shizons and treat them for 24 hours and do the same kind of fax analysis. In 24 hours, in the DMSO controls, the Shizons are able to burst racing marrows that can reinvade and form rings, and you get a nice population of rings. And as a positive control, we use a DPAP3 inhibitor that basically blocks uh, wrappers, so you see an accumulation of Shizons here. So as I read out, we quantify that ring population. And what you have to keep in mind is several reasons why you might get a decrease in ring population. One being uh, Shizon terrestre, the other one being where we're just killing parasites, that's why we see less rings. Or the last one is if we actually get rapture, we don't get invasion. But in any case, a decrease in ring uh, signifies that a compound is having an effect in the development of the, of the parasites. And that's an example 
in which we see a decrease in ring population, also an accumulation of, of Shizons. So that might be a potential DPAP3 inhibitor. So we did that screen at A micromolar, and we found about 40 compounds that actually decrease paracetamia. So by increasing the concentration, we get much more uh, effects. But those 20 of them were confirmed as DPAP1 hits that show a dose response. And of the ones that are not DPAP1 hits, we find six that show a, a clear Shizont accumulation effect. So those might be potential DPAP3 inhibitors. We also find four that decrease uh, paracetamia and also ternatrostrum Shizont accumulation. So we think those might actually be both DPAP1 and DPAP3 inhibitors. But we have to validate that. So as I show you, we've done a lot of uh, triage assays in vitro and in uh, cell-based assays. So I'm trying to go through all that and try to analyze the data. But a way to analyze it is just to look at which compounds show that decrease in paracetamia were also confirmed as DPAP1, basically those 20 dots here. And when you start analyzing the data, like families of structurally related compounds appear. And that's one example of them. We find four of compounds that are that pyridine group with that uh, nitrile group show up as uh, significantly decreasing the amount of paracetamia. And if we look at all the compounds we're able to validate, there is more than 20 that have that central scaffold that have a dose response against the EPUB1. And we have about between five and 10 different families of structurally related compounds that seem to show up all the time. So basically, the take-home medicine, we find a lot of uh, interesting keys that we can validate as DPAP1 inhibitors. Some of them have a, an effect in decreasing paracetamia. Some of them might be DPAP3 inhibitors. So our next study will be to do SIR studies, structure activity relationship study of the main families we found. But also, we want to use our activity-based probes to validate whether those inhibitors that have an effect in vivo actually hit their targets in culture by using our activity-based probes. So I just want to thank all the members of the Bogiela, especially Matt Bojo and, and Shirin. We, uh, Elmi basically introduced me to the world of parasitology. David Percival for sending us that Merck uh, compound. Uh, Phil Rosenthal for sending us uh, Fossi pain to do the uh, dose response for the Fossi pain. Michelle Arkin, which has been, was very helpful to set up the screen and giving a lot of input. And as I mentioned, Kenny and Steven, that really helped me run the, the screen. Thank you for your attention. All right, so now we get to the main part of the story. I'm gonna thank okay. uh, Edgar here. If you have questions, grab him at the coffee break. It was a really fantastic uh, example of, of uh, a winning <coughs> entry. So uh, next, I'd like to introduce the first uh, contestant this year, Veronica Anania, a graduate student from the Koskoi Lab. And she'll be uh, discussing uh, a target from Kaposi's sarcoma virus. OK. so. Um... I'm a uh, graduate student in Lana Koskoi's lab, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, blocking viral media downregulation of MHC class 1 as a potential treatment for Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. So, um, Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus is a double stranded DNA virus. Because it has such a large genome, it's capable of encoding many different genes that are responsible for um, evading the, helping the virus evade the immune system, and I'm going to be talking to you today about one of those examples. Um, primary infections by KSHV are generally unapparent. Um, generally, the immune system is quite capable of controlling this infection. However, um, upon immunosuppression, the, virus, the viral titers can increase and you can get KSHV-related diseases. And just to be clear, this, like many herpes viruses, once you're infected, you're infected for life. Um, okay, so if we look at the, uh, the infection rates around the world, you can see that KSHV infection generally um, is predominantly localized to two main areas, the Mediterranean and Sub-Saharan Africa. And in some of these countries, infection rates can, can increase over 80%. And it's currently um, the leading cause of cancer in, in several Sub-Saharan African countries for, for men and women. 
So like I said before, uh, healthy individuals generally do not have any sort of disease manifestation. Um, however, if an individual is immunocompromised and KSHV positive, they can, um, can several different types of KSHV associated malignancies can ensue. Um, the primary is Kaposi's sarcoma. It's an it's a endothelial cell cancer um, that commonly occurs in AIDS patients. And it, it's highly vascularized, so you get this bruising-like appearance um, in these tumor cells. In addition, it can also cause primary fusion lymphoma, which is a B-cell cancer. And it can also cause some types of a, a rare disorder called multicentric Castleman's disease, which is a hyperproliferation of B-cells in the lymph nodes. Um, currently, there's no cure or vaccine. Uh, this probably isn't the most lucrative vaccine development uh, program because most of the uh, affected individuals are in the developing world. And um, currently, the most common therapy to treat KSHV associated disease is to try to uh, treat the underlying cause of immunodeficiency. So, several papers recently have come out that, that, that highlight how important the cytotoxic T cell response is for fighting or for um, controlling KSHV infection. So first of all, like I said before, immunosuppressed individuals, either because of, uh, because of AIDS or because they just received an organ transplant and they're under immunosuppressive therapy, um, they, they have a high incidence of KSHV-related uh, diseases. Um, and the way they generally treat this is by either treating with heart so that uh, HIV-positive patients can, their immune systems can rebound and, and try to contain the infection on its own or um, easing up on the immunosuppressive therapy for uh, organ transplant recipients. Um, and again, this is just all to allow the immune system to fight the infection itself. Um, uh, in addition, the strength of the CTL response has been shown to inversely correlate with disease progression. So non-progressors or people who don't manifest any sort of disease um, generally have a, a lot of uh, or a high level of um, KSHV-specific CD8-positive T cell responses. Um, in contrast to patients who do develop a disease, they're usually, they usually have low CTL responses to KSHV. And this really um, highlights the importance that CTLs are playing in controlling this infection. So um, just, just to briefly go over this, uh, C8 uh, positive cytotoxic T cells recognize infected cells by looking at their MHC class 1 uh, peptide presentation on the surface of their cells. So MHC class 1 uh, presents peptides that are internal and in, in, presents intracellular peptides, and if a virus has infected a cell, um, the MHC class 1 molecules will present viral peptides on the surface of the cell. The CD8 positive T cell can recognize it and induce uh, killing inside the cell, or killing the cell in order to halt viral production and hopefully stop virus spread. Um, because viruses are so tricky, they've managed to um, evade CTLs in many different ways, one of the most common being interruption of this MHC class 1 presentation pathway. So if there's no MHC class 1 present on the surface of the cell, the CD8 positive T cell can't recognize that it's infected, the cell can go on surviving, the virus can replicate and potentially spread to new, new hosts. Um, so KSHV is, um, encodes two proteins that are capable of interfering with this MHC class 1 presentation pathway. Uh, they're called MIR1 and MIR2. It stands for modulator of immune response 1 and 2. Um, these two proteins are highly similar. They have close to 50% sequence identity. As far as we can tell so far, they function via the same pathways, via the same mechanisms. Um, so that's a good, that's a good news. If, if we find a drug that inhibits one, it will likely inhibit the other as well. Um, there are two transmembrane E3 ligases. They interact with an E2 enzyme via their ring domain. Um, they interact with MHC class 1 via transmembrane, transmembrane interactions. Um, once they're in, in connection with the E2 and the substrate, they could facilitate ubiquitination of MHC class 1, which inevitably leads to endocytosis and degradation via the lysosome. And if we do an immunoprecipitation for MHC class 1 in the presence of MIR1 and then blot for ubiquitin, you can see MHC class 1 is heavily ubiquitinated in the presence of MIR1 and MIR2. Um, and this ubiquitination is completely correlated with the degradation of MHC class 1. So um, one question we, we, will always like, we, we would like to address is how important is our MIR1 and MIR2 for uh, inhibiting the cytotoxic T cell response to KSHV? And unfortunately, we don't have any small mammal models for KSHV. Um, however, we are lucky enough to have a, a murine virus that's quite similar to KSHV called MHV68. So MHV68 is the murine model for KSHV. It's another gamma herpes virus. They have many genes that are they're very similar to each other. Um, and in, in addition, the MHV68 encodes one homolog of the MIRS called K3. 
And um, it's been shown that inhibition of K3 results in an, in an infection deficiency that is CTL dependent. So if we take a look, um, bulb C mice were intranasally infected with uh, back-derived virus, either wild-type virus up here or K3 deficient virus down here. And then splena, the spleens were isolated 14 days post-infection to look for the ability of this virus to establish a, a, an infection. And you can see um, through in situ hybridization, the wild-type virus is quite capable of colonizing the spleen in contrast to the K3 deficient virus, which there, there's hardly any viral RNA present. And we know that this process, this, this new ability for the immune system to clear this K3 deficient virus is CD8 positive or CD, CTL, uh, CTL dependent because if we deplete the CTLs in this animal, you can now see the virus is quite capable of establishing infection. And um, this really brings me to my proposal. Um, the point is, the, the purpose of the proposal is to identify a small molecule inhibitor of the MIR3 ubiquitin ligases to prevent MHC class 1 degradation and hopefully increase the CTL response to KSHV. So the screen is quite simple, um, the primary screen. I have a class 1 molecule that's fused to GFP, or I, I have it fused to other fluorophores as well. Um, and basically, I can express stably uh, transduce HeLa cells with this molecule, and I get a, a very high level of GFP, you can see it here. And um, if I create double stable cell lines that uh, express this molecule as well as MIR1, I get about a 20-fold reduction in GFP expression in the presence of MIR1 because MIR1 is now causing the degradation of this molecule. Um, and we can use this in a high-throughput assay to basically, so we'll plate these double stable cells, add the small molecule inhibitors, and look for GFP positive wells where now MHC class 1 expression has been rescued. Um, so. Secondary assays to validate these hits, um, obviously the primary assay we can use is to just look for MHC class 1 ubiquitination, uh, this is the western blot I showed you earlier, uh, to verify that MIR function is actually being inhibited. In addition, MIR2 has a slightly wider range of substrates, it can also downregulate B7.2, so we can monitor the ubiquitination levels of B7.2 to verify that in fact MIR function is being directly inhibited and that it's not just some MHC class 1 processing or trafficking issue that, that we we've, we've picked up with the inhibitor. And you know, we can do things like monitor uh, recycling the transferrin receptor to ensure that, that it's not a general or global endocytosis issue as well. Um, in the long term, it would be nice to look at a couple uh, to use in vivo animal models, and, and we have a couple of those available. So like I said, MHV68 is the KSHV homolog, or I'm sorry, um, is, is the KSHV, or the murine model for KSHV. And um, we can create an MHV68 virus that expresses MIR1 and um, in the presence or absence of this drug and then look for the ability of um, this, this drug to inhibit, um, inhibit infection by this uh, MHV68 MIR1 expressing virus. And recently, um, a lab at USC has developed a, a non-human primate model for KSHV. They can use immunocompromised marmosets and infect them with KSHV and, um, and it, and they can actually develop these KS lesions that are uh, so commonly seen on many immunocompromised patients that are experiencing KS. And uh, we can use this model to test the drug's eff efficacy at inhibiting, um, inhibiting viral pathogenesis. So um, in conclusion, KSHV represents, uh, infection represents a threat to global health, specifically in the developing world. Uh, CTL responses are important to control KSHV infection, um, MIR1 and MIR2 directly inhibit the ability for CTLs to mount a response against, um, against this virus. And so therefore, by inhibiting the MIRs, we could potentially boost the CTL response and hopefully block disease progression. So with that, I'll take questions. All right, now we have five minutes for questions. And uh, each of you is acting as a, as a judge here. You need to collect the information that you need to vote at the end of, of, the, pres of the presentation. Michelle. Thanks. So what kind of um, therapeutically relevant or valuable mechanisms of action could you have in your cell-based system besides directly inhibiting the E3 ligase? So 
Um, a lot of E3 ligases are, are in conjunction um, with dubs um, because they accidentally ubiquitate themselves and cause their own degradation. So one idea is that if, if the cellular, the, the, the small molecule wasn't actually inhibiting the mirror itself, it could potentially also be inhibiting some interaction like that. Like if it inhibited the interaction with the dub, it would have a higher turnover rate and potentially be degraded faster. Um, we really don't know that much about the cellular uh, partners of the mirrors. We know part of the endocytosis um, machinery is involved, but um, that's, I guess that's another screen for another day. <laughs> Genes that that uh, you know might cause the GFP to not be uh, degraded, uh, other than mere one. To not be degraded. Yeah, in your assay. Could you repeat the question? Um, so the question was, what are some of the other candidate genes that could be inhibited? I'm assuming is what you meant. Um, that are causing MHC to not be degraded. I, anything that has to do with endocytosis, essentially, if, could be disrupting the, the, at least the primary screen, right? If it's blocking um, or slowing down endocytosis of the MHC class one molecule from the surface of the cell, it would look to be a, a false positive. So those would have to be screened out in the secondary assays. Well, I guess the question is, what, what kind of secondary assay would allow you to, to screen those out of can you, can you repeat it because um, he's can, asking can me you, what other sort of secondary assays I could use to to what I'm sorry to validate yeah. um, besides the amino precipitations to look for functionality um, I suppose I I know what you want me to say <laughs> um, you can use you can you can try to look for a direct binding between the small molecule and um, and and the mere proteins using fluorescence um, anisotropy uh, to do direct binding assays, but yeah. Yeah, the reason we want people to use a microphone is so it shows up on the on the tape. Other questions? Yes. Thanks. You happen to have hit on a favorite topic, so. <laughs> um, the primary readout that you're thinking about with just being GFP could be right. a it could plate be any floor based, floor, or, mm -hmm, but it yeah. could be a plate based readout. So we, yeah. each well, you look right. at total fluorescence, mm -hmm. or it could be a high content readout where you're doing essentially automated microscopy. Mm -hmm. What advantages would you see potentially from a mechanistic standpoint for doing a high content or a microscopy based assay? Thinking of, say, endocytosis and other of these mechanistic questions. Um, so doing a high throughput versus just I'm sorry, I guess I don't really understand your question. So high content assays are automated microscopy assays. Right. So you're looking, so you're doing a high throughput assay where you're looking at the cell itself and looking at the fluorescence of the oh, cell. Oh yeah, no, I definitely was assuming that this would be an automated process where we would be able to screen a large number of compounds just looking, sorry. Right. So it's, you can use a fluorimeter, so right. where you're just looking at the total fluorescence right. intensity of the well and oh, okay. that was the way you described it. Or you can do it by microscopy. I see. High throughput microscopy, where then you're looking at the fluorescence okay. in the so cell. The spatial readout so you can actually see the localization of the substrate. Um, Is there an advantage to that? I don't know that there's necessary. I mean, it, it, obviously, you want MHC class one to be at the surface of the cell. If it's not at the surface of the cell, then you have a you have a problem. Um, if if you're getting sequestration of MHC class one in some endocytic vesicle, then it's probably not a direct effect. It's not inhibiting the mirrors directly. Um, so that, that could also uh, be very informative. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Wonderful. All right, thanks very much, Veronica. So you could, you could sense from the questions, uh, you know, it's a cell-based assay which has some advantages and some strengths. Um, and then people asked about selectivity, but that's the, those are the, that's the balance that, a balance that you guys are going to have to think about. Uh, how do you sort that out in secondary assays versus how important is it to do up front? Um, 
The other thing, wonderful thing we heard there was the compelling nature of the target, the uh, disease. How important is that in your own minds? All right, so next uh, we have Larissa Podest from UCSF uh, telling us about a target from tuberculosis. Oh, excuse me, Chagas. Um, I will be talking about C51, a drug target for Chagas heart disease. And this is the uh, second time I'm presenting this proposal at this meeting. Uh, Chagas disease is the leading cause of heart failure in Latin America, but is neglected by pharmaceutical industry as it primarily affects the rural poor. Commonly transmitted, disease is commonly transmitted by a blood-sucking insect, the kissing bug, and also through blood transfusions. Causative agent of Chagas disease is a unicellular parasite, Trypanosoma cruci, and current therapy suffers from severe side effects, limited efficacy, and emerging drug resistance. Therefore, there is a critical need to identify new targets in Trypanosoma cruci in order to develop new drugs. Uh, sterol biosynthetic pathway is an excellent target um, because in um, all organisms using um, sterols in plasma membrane to build plasma membrane, um, uh, this sterol synthesized through uh, the very uh, similar pathway starting from squalene and protozoa and fungi have very similar uh, pathway to synthesize sterols. Uh, this pathway also exists in human and leads to cholesterol, which plays in human similar role as ergosterol and ergosterol like, uh, like uh, sterols play in fungi and protozoa. The critical step in this pathway is 14 alpha demethylation of uh, lanasterol and the buricol, which are um, 14. Uh, alpha methylated preco precursors, uh, and this methyl group is removed by CYP51, which is uh, uh, sterol 14 alpha demethylase. CYP51 is essential cytochrome P450. Uh, it uses prostate, heme prostatic group for catalysis, and this is an important fact for our high throughput screening assay. Uh, CYP51 is therapeutic target of antifungal azole drugs, fluconazole, uh, itraconazole, posaconazole, and others. And uh, this enzyme in Ticruci is a prospective target uh, for treatment of Chagas disease. And recently, posaconazole and ravoconazole, which were originally developed as antifungal agents, were posed for clinical trials against Tecruci. It happens like since last uh, meeting where I presented my target. So this fact pretty much validates uh, this target. But while ASOS provide an important proof of concept, uh, they are extremely expensive and limited by hepatic and renal toxicity. For example, recently approved uh, posaconazole for treatment of fungal uh, infections. Uh, one treatment, treatment um, dose per day cost $110. So it's quite a lot to treat uh, for treatment of neglected disease. Just, um, I want briefly address the host pathogen specificity. As I mentioned, CYP51 is present in human host. However, if you look at sequence identity between these enzymes, um, the sequence identity between fungal and uh, protozoan CYP51 is only 28% uh, compared to animal, including human. So this enzyme uh, are pretty diverse, and this why it is possible to treat um, fungi in human without harming um, human. Uh, so we developed a uh, high throughput screening assay, which is based on the P450 properties to shift band in response to ligand binding. This is basically a UV visible spectroscopic assay, which we adopted for 384 well format. 
A sea itself is used for maybe half a century already since cytochromes P450 have been discovered. We just made it in a different format. Uh, this assay has been validated by my group two times already. We did screening on C51 from mycobacterium tuberculosis, which I will talk a little bit later. And we also screened another mycobacterium protein, C130. So both this work, uh, works are published. Um, for screening of Trypanosoma cruci C51, uh, we spent lots of time in the cold room trying to prepare the recombinant protein. So now we have an excellent uh, expression system, E. coli expression system. So we can uh, produce, we actually produce in 75 milligram of purified protein per uh, a liter of uh, a bacterial culture. And this enzyme is catalytically active and crystallizable. So now I want to present proof of concept. As I said, we screen uh, C51 from mycobacterium tuberculosis. In mycobacterium, this is not a drug target. However, this was the first CYP51 uh, recombinantly obtained and crystallized. So we tried this approach and we did uh, high throughput screening to find screening kits which we co-crystallized, determine the structure. And we came out uh, with a scaffold, with parental scaffold which we uh, analyzed and selected 10 different compounds uh, related, chemically related to the scaffold based on the analysis of crystal structure. And at that time, we had already recombinant T. cruci C51, and we screened this library against T. cruci, a library of 10 compounds against T. cruci C51. And we found that one of these inhibitors has sub nanomolar affinity to T. cruci C51. Uh, we called it LP10 and we subjected, subjected it to the secondary assays in cell culture against mouse macrophages. It kills the in mouse macrophages at five micromolar, and it also uh, affects, it actually kills Trypanosoma cruci in bovine skeletal muscle cells by destroying uh, the membrane of the healthy cell. So here is uh, the uh, damaged membrane of Trypanosoma cruci within muscle cell. So, and then we went to uh, um, mouse model of acute Chagas disease, and we found that this uh, molecule is approximately as good as posaconazole uh, uh, because it was efficient in treatment of mice, uh, we used um, acute model, uh, so we treated mice 24 hours post-infection for 30 days, uh, 40 milligram per kilogram twice a day. Uh, all five mice survived for six months after treatment, then they were sacrificed, and 60% uh, uh, of these mice were uh, cured. Uh, and we actually developed an assay, uh, GCMS assay, to analyze sterol content, and we indeed confirmed that uh, by treating Trypanosoma cruci with uh, our inhibitor or posaconazole, we changed sterol composition. So basically, uh, the main uh, T. cruci sterols disappear, which is epistyrol and ficasterol, which just have leftover of epistyrol, and methylated precursors accumulate. And this, uh, how it is actually affects the T. cruci membrane, membrane here. So uh, we also have now crystallized and determined the crystal structure of T. cruci. This was uh, actually a breakthrough in our research. Now uh, we basically know how T. cruci binds uh, antifungal drug uh, uh, fluconazole, which is here in this crystal structure. We also know that T. cruci has a large channel which accommodates uh, posaconazole here. Uh, we just yesterday solved the crystal structure with posaconazole. I do not have it here yet. But actually now I can answer the question why we want to screen against T. cruci uh, itself. Because previously we screened against mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is yellow structure. So we have now both structures and we can uh, compare them and we can tell that 
Uh, tick risk structure is very different, which is expectable. Sequence identity, 25%. We have uh, certain structural elements in tick rusi, which is blue, which make active site much smaller, and this is why we would expect to find different skull folds. And uh, our next steps obviously would be to high throughput screen uh, directly to cruise enzyme. Uh, we also want to utilize fragment chemistry screen to explore the, um, to, to try to generate new scaffolds uh, using them. And of course, now we can do in silica screening of zinc or other virtual libraries to identify uh, inhibitors uh, that way. And I would like to thank all these people for, for participating in this work. All of them are from Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry at UCSF and Sandler Center for Basic Research in Parasitic Disease. And I just want to thank here ILS Beamline for helping us tremendously with our crystallographic part of work. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Um, I was confused by your statement at the beginning um, that uh, CYP51 would be an excellent target because this sterile biosynthesis pathway is present both in animals and in fungi and protozoa. And then you said that, um, that one of the uh, problems with the present treatment is that it has heavy side effects. And then you said that, um, that uh, the azole-based targets have... Um, are going, that are going into clinical trials have hepatic and renal toxicity. So wouldn't you expect a lot of side effects if, if you're targeting something that is in a pathway that exists also in, in human? Uh, but side effects are not related to cross interaction with human C51. Toxicity is related basically to pharmacokinetics of these drugs. Um, uh, the difference between CYP51 and fungi or prednisone is below 30%. And actually, two months ago, crystal structure of human CYP51 was also determined by Canadian group. So now, actually, we are in an excellent position directly to compare structurally what our drug is going to do to the target and to the host. So now you'll be able to eliminate cross interactions. It was almost no cross interaction. As I said, toxicity was due to other reasons, not due to the cross interactions. OK, thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about um, how potent a binder is posiconazole and fluconazole in your assays? So just, just in comparison to the, the, what looks like a pretty decent hit that you found? Uh, how, how they compare? Yeah, in terms of potency. Uh, potency, well, fluconazole is not potent toward does It does very minor sense, so it is not a good uh, drug for ticrusi. However, posiconazole, and recently, like two weeks ago, I learned that ravoconazole is also taken to clinical trials to tic uh, ticrusi. So both this posiconazole and ravoconazole just uh, are at the beginning of clinical trials with cruci, and everything uh, we know is animal models. So in uh, mouse or in mouse models, posiconazole behaves uh, uh, very well, like as well as our heat, which we recently found. It cures about 60% of animals, and um, uh, Posiconazole is known to be renally and hepatically toxic. We don't know this about uh, our inhibitor because uh, we just finished uh, in vivo studies in mice. We not finished like we did one six months experiment. And so we have not seen any toxicity associated with this compound. However, we are looking now somebody who would invest in this compound and try to put it in the next stage of uh, research. Yeah. 
with your new crystal structure, it's certainly appealing to do a fragment-based approach or a uh, or an, an silico approach, as you described. Do you, though, by doing more HTS, do you expect to get hits that are better than one nanomolar? You did pretty well already, even though you were screening the wrong enzyme. Uh, can you repeat your question? <laughs> You, by screening the TB enzyme, you yes. got a very potent hit um, in, a, in, a, in some medicinal chemistry. You got a very potent hit at one at one nanomolar. Do you think you're going to do better by screening by rescreening the um, uh, the trypanosomal enzyme? Oh, actually, the hit we identified originally, which we used as a uh, scaffold, this was a hit. Uh, these 10 compounds I selected just by analyzing how this heat interacts with structure. So we found that this group here interacts with absolutely conserved region in C51. So these actually compounds were not from screening per se. It was my analysis of the screening heat. And uh, this one, when we selected all this, we started to try uh, against mycobacterial enzyme and T. cruci. And in this secondary screening, which we did manually for 10 compounds, we found that this compound has affinity below one nanomolar. We used uh, a UV visible assay, which cannot really discriminate uh, compounds with affinity below nanomolar range. It's, you just do not see the signal anymore. I think the question is, why do you need to do a screen? So why do we need? Uh, well, we have this uh, one compound. Uh, and as I said, uh, we uh, now know the structure. And we see that crystal structures are very different. So we think that we simply missed uh, many uh, useful scaffolds by screening against M tuberculosis. And uh, we would like to screen against real target and just hoping to find more uh, potent or different scaffolds. So the cytochrome P450s that are in the liver are more promiscuous at binding small molecules than the CYP51s are, which only bind Exactly. Really these. Yeah. So is that a concern, cross-screening with the liver enzymes, the metabolic enzymes? Do you find that you can find compounds that bind to this cytochrome, but not to the more promiscuous 3A4s and things that would be difficult to drug around? Mm. Yeah, this is we exactly uh, in the process of doing this assay right now for this compound. But uh, this actually pretty routine assay, and uh, any compound can be easily subjected to this assay. And if compound is really metabolized by the liver cytochromes, you just uh, eliminate it from secondary and uh, screening and screening in the animal model. It's just high throughput everywhere now. All right, so a different set of advantages, some uh, chemical validation already, uh, some crystallography that might help in development, and a different mix of assays that you saw. Um, the next group, and I, it is a group, uh, apparently. Uh, I don't know how they're going to switch in 10 minutes, but it'll be represented. The group is the Open Source Drug Discovery Group, a team from UC Berkeley that is uh, mentored by Andre Shali at UCSF. So it's a cross trans bay team. The open source drug discovery concept was pioneered by uh, Samir Brahmachari uh, uh, in India. And uh, it's essentially a virtual drug discovery uh, project that's worldwide. Uh, anyone in the room can participate. And uh, I'll let, let the team tell you about it, but uh, it's a, an exciting uh, experiment in a new way to do drug discovery. So uh, Sharmista Majumdar is going to represent the team. Is that right? And, OK. And uh, they're going to be, this group will be talking about a, a set of targets from tuberculosis. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so 
I'm talking on behalf of InnoRes, so that's our, uh, so we are a student group, a student organization newly formed on the UC Berkeley campus. InnoRes stands for Innovations and Research, and we're part of the, uh, like the worldwide open source drug discovery initiative and with the UC Berkeley component of it. So um, our title is like the RV1258C pump, and I'm gonna come to that, but uh, just some background. Um, so the, the disease we are looking at is TB, and I'm not going to go into details of TB. We all know it's a pulmonary infection, which uh, is more, more prevalent in the developing world. But the slide which I show here is basically talking about the drug resistance in TB. And that is one of the main problems that we face in TB uh, uh, treatment nowadays. There are m multiple um, MDR TB, which is basically drug resistant forms of TB, which are coming up. Uh, all over the world, and but there is a prevalence of them in like Asia and also India, where you see the MDR form. Like 70% of the TB strains are MDR. So uh, the focus of our talk is finding an inhibitor uh, which would kind of get, which would uh, preclude this drug resistance. And uh, towards this, we are looking at this group of proteins, the bacterial efflux pumps. So efflux pumps are actually present in multiple organisms, and they are uh, transmembrane proteins. And uh, in general, they're supposed to have evolved to get rid of uh, like general foreign toxic material from the cell. They're active transporters driven by localized iron gradients. And um, what is its role in drug resistance? What is seen as like in TB and other such pathogens where drug resistance evolves, uh, there is a lot of evidence in literature showing how these uh, efflux pumps basically prevent, uh, like basically they, they efflux out the drug and hence prevent the cytosolic accumulation of the drug. And since the drug cannot accumulate, it cannot basically work on the pathogen and uh, so the, it's a drug resistance, that leads to drug resistance. And so um, oh, there has been a lot of uh, interest in developing efflux pump inhibitors. So these would be inhibitors which would inhibit these pumps and hence st prevent this efflux of the drug in this case so that it, the drug would accumulate and hence we could get rid of this, get over this resistance phenotype. So this, this uh, slide just shows different efflux pumps that are present in bacteria. And the only thing I want to focus on now is this MFS, or the major facilitators superfamily, to which the target that we propose belongs to. And another important member of this family is Nori, which is from Staph aureus. And there are some preliminary studies done in this, on this pump too, which kind of uh, makes, it, makes our story interesting, like how these pumps are uh, important. So some examples of efflux pump inhibitors from literature. Um, these are some examples which I'll go through fast, like this cyclopentothiol tetracycline is uh, shown to inhibit the efflux pump in these bacteria. And, and oh, sorry. Uh, and one thing which I would like to focus on is this piperin, which is, a, which is a phytochemical, and it was found by drug screening. And what, what, is, what, it's, what it does is it inhibits this uh, pump in a number of bacteria like S. aureus, uh, even the methylicin-resistant re S. aureus. And this figure here shows how it increases, uh, it decreases the deflux. So on top here is um, the, is, so it's a fluorescent space assay, but you see how the drug is effluxed out less um, on top. That's compared to here without the inhibitor. Okay, so coming to TB, the organism we are interested in, um, the genome was sequenced around 10 years ago, and the genome uh, basically comes up with these 20 open reading frames of efflux pumps. Uh, what I have highlighted over here in green are the drug-resistant cl clinical isolates. And what I mean by that is in, in clinical isolates, uh, these efflux pumps seem to be upregulated, overexpressed, which kind of points, uh, makes you wonder that since they are upregulated, maybe they have a role in drug resistance. And... Um, so the pump which we are focusing on is the R1258C efflux pump of MTB. And um, this is, um, it's a TAP2-like efflux pump, so it basically encodes for tetracycline aminoglycoside resistance. And it has the 12 transmembrane regions. And uh, some, uh, some information about it from uh, other groups is like it's overexpressed in the presence of drugs. And the clinical significance is many clinical isolates you see an overexpression of this pump 
and these are like resistant to all these these groups of antibiotics which are used in TB treatment. So this kind of makes us interested in this pump, given that it seems to show a direct correlation with drug resistance. So now I'll turn it over to Michael. Oops. So I just want to present these, uh, this one. these two slides where we summarize our basis for um, expecting to see an interaction between 1258C and the WHO's first-line antibiotics, the so-called essential antibiotics for the treatment of tuberculosis. So there exist already some reports of the overexpression of 1258C in the presence of the antibiotics um, in blue. So very direct evidence there. Um, and also, you see those overexpressed in clinical isolates of MDR-TB. Then there's also evidence, uh, or, or I, I should say there's analogy here um, that pyrazinamide is similar in its uh, class to that to isoniazid. So there's some expectation that similar antibiotics might um, have the interaction with a pump that's able to uh, extrude um, a chemical of, of a similar structure. And then with uh, streptomycin, it's an aminoglycoside. And um, the TAP efflux pumps have been shown to extrude aminoglycosides. So one could expect that there would be um, interaction there as well. And then the second line drugs that are used to treat more difficult cases, such as the fluoroquinolones, um, have been shown directly. That's, again, the color coding, the light blue. Uh, you do see the pump overexpressed um, in the presence of those drugs in particular. And then again, uh, by analogy, TAP efflux pumps have been shown to extrude, uh, extrude these immunoglycosides. Uh, and the polypeptide-like uh, compound, uh, capriomycin. Thank you. Uh, so now that we have the motivation set, uh, we know that if we have an uh, inhibitor for the efflux pumps, we can actually reduce the dosage that is required, and that will help in reducing side effects a lot. And uh, so basically, now we will go into the assay area. So this is like a very general setup of uh, what are the different assays that, are, uh, that people do to uh, decide on a small molecule inhibitor for a protein. Uh, so there's a state zero, which is like just protein interaction with small molecules, which can be done using uh, fluorescence microscopy. Uh, stage one is what is uh, where we are more interested, and where uh, so this is like an animal assay in which we actually grow uh, see the effect of uh, these small molecules on the efflux of drugs in and out of the organism. Uh, stage two is like where we look at uh, uh, cytotoxicity. We look at whether the drug molecule will kill the a person faster than the organism. Uh, stage three and four are more uh, uh, on the same lines in how we develop the drug to be uh, or determine the small molecule, which will actually go uh, have good uh, pharmac pharmacokinetic effects in the organism, reduce cyto cytotoxicity, have more bioavailability. Uh, so I'll uh, focus on the stage one because that is more relevant to uh, this talk. So basically, there are two assays which uh, which, which people have been doing for a long time uh, are quite uh, well standardized. Uh, one of them is the accumulation assay. So the principle behind the accumulation assay is simple. If uh, efflux pump uh, throws out drugs, so if the uh, expression of efflux pump goes down, then your, bio, and then your cytosolic uh, availability of the drug molecule increases. And so theoretically, at a very low MIC value, uh, at, a, at a concentration which is low, lower than the standard MIC of resistance strains, you should see that your cells start dying. So basically, uh, what we want to do is like, what we, what we have uh, are strains which have overexpressed um, uh, efflux pump protein, rb 258 c which are rifam, uh, rifampicin resistant. What we would like to uh, screen is have a uh, put different concentration of our inhibitory molecule and see uh, the uh, uh, how, like, how, how many cells are alive after a certain uh, period of time. Uh, at uh, concent drug concentrations which are lower than the MIC, and uh, this will be a direct indi indication whether the efflux pump, efflux pump has been inhibited or not. Um, uh, 
A secondary assay that uh, people uh, do is ethidium bromide efflux assay, which because uh, some these efflux pump uh, families have been shown to efflux out ethidium bromide as well. So by uh, just seeing the fluorescence uh, due to the binding of ethidium bromide to DNA, you can actually see uh, whether your uh, efflux, efflux pump is being inhibited or not. Uh, with that, so in conclusion, so we have a target which we think is very uh, attractive to reduce uh, the uh, drug concentration doses as it required for tuberculosis, and we would like to use the STS facility to determine uh, uh, a drug molecule or a series of drug molecule families which can, which can be developed further. Uh, so yeah, so we are uh, we are representing the OSDD team, and uh, like we would like to acknowledge our mentors and. Um, the team, and so we would also like to acknowledge our team in India, which uh, is actively working with this uh, model, has developed a lot of uh, biological models which can be tried out, uh, and also like will provide us with a lot of uh, guidance in terms of drug selection and, uh, and other things. Okay, uh, that's it, thank you. All right, questions? A tried and true target? I have a question. The screen would happen in TB or in smegmatis, or what's your what's your organism of that you're going to target? Uh, so we would like to do it in tuberculosis, but uh, it depends on the facilities we have in the STS. If they do not have a BSL-3 facility to do the STS screening, uh, in that case, then obviously, then we would go to the non-virulent strains like M. smegmatis, and we have all the uh, biological organisms developed. Yeah, and it's all yeah, and there are other advantages also with smegmatis, like it goes grows faster and uh, other things. Okay, sorry over here. So I have a question about. Okay, you may or may not know the answer. Don't worry, but in um, MDR, so efflux pumps, ABC cassette transporter efflux pumps, pumps have been known for ages in humans and are a major cause of cancer drugs not being effective. What do you know about? trying to do this very thing with human cells with cancer drugs and its relative um, effectiveness. Okay. Uh, so from the, from the uh, so basically our knowledge is quite restricted to TB at this point of time, but uh, we would, I don't see any reasons why it should not work, except for the fact that it might lead to certain uh, side effects, which, which might be, you know, yeah, I don't know, yeah. It's something to think about because it hasn't worked in oh, cancer. Yeah. So there are companies that have been trying to do that for a long time and it hasn't worked very well. So understanding why not and why that is or isn't relevant to your case might be helpful for you, thinking about the drug ability of your project yeah. going forward. For tuberculosis, it's like people, uh, so piperin that we were talking about, uh, it has been developed into a drug already, which is uh, being administered with the present uh, tuberculosis uh, drugs, and it has been shown to reduce the drug dosage by half, which is like very significant because it reduces your toxicity and all other related issues. So in that aspect, we are, and the price also, yes. And in that aspect, we are, I would say more than 90% sure that if, a, if we get an inhibitor for this uh, kind of an efflux pump, efflux pump, which is very uh, uh, specific for MTB, then we should have good uh, effects on inpatients. Uh, ju just to push on that a little bit more from the specific case. Um, so the target, it, could you describe some of the biological work that's been done on understanding its fundamental role here in, in multi-drug resistance and what your thoughts are on other efflex pumps picking up the slack in, in, in the case of specifically targeting um, 1258C? Uh, so Regarding this clinical significance, people have shown that this gene is overexpressed when uh, uh, specimens are a drug. So basically, if I can go back to the, so basically the green uh, drugs that you see, there have been clinical studies in which people have shown that if when you induce uh, the, uh, like uh, when you expose the organism to the drug, the gene expression increases. 
uh, and also direct studies have been shown where the mutants which in which the, the gene has been deleted have shown a reduced resistance levels. So uh, regarding the other reflux pumps uh, coming into the picture, it's more like, yeah, so that study is like more or less uh, shows that this uh, each efflux pump has a very specific drug that it uh, pushes out, uh, family dependent, and if one of if the if one of the efflux pumps is reduced or it, its its expression is stopped or its function is stopped, then uh, other efflux pumps do not contribute that much. Otherwise, the mutant would have not had a reduced resistance level. Sorry, I, I just wanted to follow up quickly on Tom's question about uh, the bacterium that you use to do the screen um, and the format that you would use to, to do it in high throughput. You, you would have, this, this would be on plates or in, in dishes? Can you describe that, please? Uh, so we, it would be like in the dishes that, uh, rather the plates that are used for HTS uh, screening, uh, microtiter plates that are used for HTS uh, screening right now. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, we would be using those dishes for uh, the assays. And, and we'll be, like, directly checking for, like, cytotoxicity, so doing it in microtiter plates. And so we can look at, like, the turbidity of the solution as an uh, uh, estimate of the, uh, like, growth or death of the organism. And also, if we do the ethidium bromide uh, assay, then we can directly look at fluorescence uh, based on uh, DNA hybridization or DNA binding, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we tried you here just last question. <laughs> um, thanks, Tom. Uh, um, so Hiroshi Nikaido has knock, knocked out most of these pumps in, in Mycobacterium spigmatis here, here at Berkeley. And um, they have, in, v, in vitro, they have relatively modest effects for most of the antibiotics. So the question, two questions. First off, What's the clinical significance of a twofold effect, which is uh, a two or fourfold effect, which is most of what he saw? And secondly, this getting back to the screening, following up on the screening question, how much of a difference do you need to see in order to discrim uh, discriminate in a high throughput screen? Um, so clinically, I guess uh, the thing is that if you, uh, with the reduction in the MyC values, you reduce the uh, dose, your dosage level of your first line drug or second line drug reduces. And that is what we think is more clinically relevant. We are not expecting the efflux pump uh, inhibitors to act as drugs themselves. They are like more like helping the drugs get into the organism and kill it. So the dosage is going down. And that, I, that we think is clinically relevant because that reduces your cost, your, cyto your toxicity for the patients, and also reduces uh, the number of doses that people take. So it might increase pa patient compliance and other issues that are related. Um, coming back to the second, uh, issue, uh, second uh, question, so basically, uh, the amount of reduction it would be dependent on the initial concentration that we add and a lot of other factors. So the assay would have a lot of controls that we would be setting up, and I guess the behavior of the control would give us a better indication as to what should be the threshold for our drug uh, case. Like we would have, uh, we we have strains which are known to be resistant to rifampicin. So there. Um, say, uh, the number of cells that that control has would be a very good uh, threshold as to seeing like what is the amount of uh, decrease that we're having. But having said that, you have to also see, uh, like, uh, the, uh, I guess it would be the MIC where we're looking at 90% inhibition in the uh, turbidity of the solution. If I may just to follow, follow briefly, that, um, that I'd, I'd be a little concerned about that because for rifampin resistance, the one you picked out, the shift in MIC is about 100-fold. Mm -hmm. But the kinds of shifts that I think you're likely to see with efflux pumps are fourfold. They're much more different, so that it's hard to set thresholds for HTS based on this dramatic uh, difference in uh, genotypic resistance. Okay. Hi, sorry, just to follow up on the question about the format. Are these grown in liquid culture or in Okay, so they're, they're not grown on um, agar or anything like that? No, you can, but yeah, these are liquid cultures. Liquid cultures. Yeah. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, so this is the point where Tamina is going to sequester the judges to our secret location. And um, you need to think about how you're going to vote on these uh, vastly different projects on three different pathogens with different rationale, different assays, uh, different secondary assays available. Um, the question is, what do you think is important in choosing a target, and, and how, do, how do the various criteria balance for you in each of these projects? Um, well, you're thinking about that. I'd like to introduce you to a very special person who's here today, Michelle Arkin of the SMDC uh, Small Molecule Discovery Center at UCSF. And she's going to uh, take a few minutes to tell us about this uh, great facility and resource for uh, scientists in the Bay Area. So Michelle, thank you. Thank you first to Tom for, and uh, Tamina for inviting me and for setting up this great symposium and for including the SMDC in um, this competition last year and this year. It's, working with Edgar was a great experience and I think you can see that um, his screen was very successful and it was, um, it's all the difference when you're really well thought out target and a really well thought out screen and set of secondary and tertiary assays. So um, kudos t to that, that was really, did set a very high bar. Okay, so um, my basic job today is to entertain you while the judges are talking. <laughs> so I have about 10 minutes of presentation, but then there's other stuff, and, and I'm happy to address any questions, especially if there are screens that you're interested in doing or drug discovery um, issues that, that you're interested in exploring. Okay, so I'm going to talk today generally about the Small Molecule Discovery Center and about doing probe discovery or drug discovery, so more broadly called small molecule discovery, in an academic setting. So our mission at the, the SMDC is to provide UCSF, but as you can see, we work with people from a lot of universities and also companies, to provide UCSF with small molecule discovery capabilities. And there are three basic roles that I think we have. One is to develop probes, which are molecules that are highly selective for the biology of interest, not necessarily drugs, but selective enough and potent enough for you to explore biological questions. So a lot of what comes to us are um, projects where people are interested in exploring novel biology that they've uncovered and they need a, a tool molecule to help them characterize that further. Um, also, in a related goal, using these small molecules can help validate, uh, explore that target biology and also validate that as a drug discovery target. And then finally, because so many important biological tools are not uh, well served by contemporary drug discovery approaches, we're very interested in expanding the range of what we consider druggable target and developing new technologies and exploring new technologies for addressing those so far unmet target needs. Okay, so with those goals in mind, uh, more broadly, why do we do lead discovery or small molecule discovery in academia? And I probably don't need to belabor this in this audience, but I do get asked this a lot by pharmaceutical people. And I would say three things. Basically, one, academic research has, uh, for many years, been driving biological innovation. Many of the new targets that we identify and start working on in the pharmaceutical industry were originally discovered at places like UCSF and Berkeley. So we've already been playing an important role in new target discovery, and adding small molecule spin to that can really um, help to validate that biology and lower the risk for a pharmaceutical industry picking that up. Secondly, uh, academic research can also drive technological innovation in drug discovery. This traditionally probably didn't happen as much in academics as in the pharmaceutical industry because it tends to be a large engineering-oriented enterprise. But now with um, centers like ours, you see much more of these tool uh, development laboratories uh, coming up and being able to develop new technologies like fragment-based drug discovery is one of the technologies that we work on, uh, and bringing that into to an academic setting. Okay, and finally, the main topic of today's symposium is that we, as an academic institution, can address major medical unmet needs that are neglected by the pharmaceutical industry. And these fall largely into two camps, uh, diseases that lots and lots of poor people get, or that not very many people get in developed countries. So um, childhood cancers, more unusual cancers, 
uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and then the neglected third world diseases that we're talking about today. So you'll see that a lot of our projects fall into those camps. And overall, uh, why do we need to do all three of those things? There's a huge need for innovation in, in drug discovery, and there, anybody who works in drug discovery already knows this, but just to give you an overview of um, the process and some of the reasons, uh, drug discovery is, can loosely be divided into nine different steps, identifying and validating the target, identifying initial chemical matter, and that's uh, high throughput screening is a very common tool for doing that, then turning that um, chemical matter usually doesn't have the selectivity, the potency, or the pharmacological properties necessary for a drug. So chemical optimization uh, based on a cell-based optimization happens in hit to lead then based on pharmacological or animal-based optimization happens in lead optimization. Then you identify a single chemical that you're going to take, or a small number of chemicals, that you'll take into safety and toxicology studies that we collectively call um, investigational new drug enabling studies. You then file an IND or an investigational new drug application with the FDA, and that's when you can enter human clinical trials. Then the three uh, tri clinical trial phases roughly measure um, dose and pharmacokinetics, uh, initial lead of efficacy and uh, dose optimization studies, and then efficacy and safety studies. Okay? And then we file an NDA or a new drug application with the FDA, and then we have our pill or our liquid to inject or whatever. So this takes 10 to 15 years to develop. And uh, as Daria so beautifully described this morning, it's not, doesn't go this way, it goes this way. <laughs> About 1% of projects that are initiated reach the NDA stage, and lots and lots of those fail in the clinic. So I think that's something that I didn't appreciate as a, a basic researcher until I got into clinical development. So about two thirds of compounds drop out in humans due to lack of efficacy, uh, unknown toxicities, pure, uh, poor pharmacokinetics. Finally, uh, all the drugs that have ever been developed for human diseases target about 200 proteins in the human genome. So that's a very small percentage of the genome. So there are lots of targets that we're just not addressing at all, some of which will be very important pharmacologically. So academic research can help fill this innovation gap, lower the risk of new targets, lower the risk of new technologies. So the Small Molecule Discovery Center is, um, we're about 20 people, roughly evenly divided between chemistry and biology. And these are our three core functions. One that you've heard about today is the high throughput screening core, and that involves screening, assay development, and also chemi-informatics. Uh, so some of the tools that we have at our disposal in that group is a series of liquid handling robotics, a, a deck of 180,000 small molecules. This is, I'd say, average for an academic lab, small for an industrial organization. And we also have genome-wide siRNA screening. We have a human siRNA library. Berkeley has uh, several animal genomes, siRNA genomes, for developmental biology, and we work closely with them around those. We can do biochemical-based assays, uh, such as the one that Edgar mentioned, also high content, which I'll describe in a bit, that's automated microscopy, and also fragment-based screens. And then we have an informaticist. It's one thing to get all this data, it's another thing to be able to put it into a format that you can make chemical decisions and biological decisions on. So a lot of work goes on in, in informatics. Then once you have chemical matter, we'll go into a lead discovery approach. We have biologists and chemists both focused on this. This is a grant-funded collaborative model, so many of the projects are uh, things that originated in high-throughput screening that have then entered hit-to-lead or lead optimization chemistry, and that's in a series of different therapeutic areas, trypanosomiasis, neurodegeneration, uh, other neglected diseases, and cancer. Again, as I was saying, these neglected diseases, either because they're small numbers of people or large numbers of poor people. And then also this technology development approach, uh, two areas that we're focusing on there are targeted pro-drug technologies and then fragment-based screening using uh, high-throughput surface plasmon resonance 
I won't talk about fragment screening today, but something that happened recently that I think is really exciting for us is that the uh, National Cancer Institute is seeking to reinvigorate their drug discovery engine. And so they enlisted the help of about 10 or 11 academic institutions that focus in early stage drug discovery, and we're the focus in fragment-based drug discovery, to help uh, be the engine for lead discovery and target validation for the NCI. So that's called the Chemical Biology Consortium. And we'll be focusing on challenging targets there, uh, particular interest in protein-protein interactions and allosterically regulated enzymes. So since we're talking about neglected diseases today, I wanted to highlight some of the work that we've been doing with the Sandler Center for Tropical Diseases, uh, which is at UCSF. It's just across the hall from us. And the mission of the Sandler Center is to provide a drug discovery and development pipeline starting from target validation and going through clinical development uh, for the, the big five parasitic diseases, including uh, African trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness, Chagas disease, malaria, schistosomiasis, and leishmania, which is another kinetoplastid like trypanosomes. So uh, the Small Molecule Discovery Center, the Sandler Center is set up as a series of cores. And um, I run the high throughput screening core for the Sandler Center. And Adam Renslow, I should have mentioned, um, my, bo my boss here is Jim Wells. He's the director of the center and the chair of our department in pharmaceutical chemistry. And Adam Renslow runs the chemistry group. I run the biology group. So examples of the recent programs that Adam and I have been focusing on with the Sandler Center include a cell-based and targeted discovery for T. cruzi, uh, automated screening for, cysto, for cystosoma mansoni. I'll talk a little bit about those two. And then we have a series of other uh, technology and target discovery applications on um, other diseases. OK, so let's just talk about a, a well-developed drug discovery program at the Sandler Center is in T. cruzi. And they have a compound that's um, in IND enabling studies right now. So it's in safety pharmacology studies, preparing to go into the clinic. And it's a protease, a cysteine protease inhibitor in T. cruzi. And their drug discovery approach is um, not one that you should expect. You should expect to have to do chemistry. But they didn't do any chemistry. They, got, they used a library that was very drug-like started with an enzymatic assay looking at cruzane, which is the cysteine protease, essential cysteine protease in T. cruzi. Uh, after that enzymatic assay, they did a long-term cell survival assay where we're looking at uh, macrophages that are infected with T. cruzi and whether those macrophages survive. The macrophage will only survive for 30 or 40 days if the T. cruzi have been completely killed. So this is a, a very a uh, high bar acetyl assay, and it correlates very well with animal activity, provided that the compound pharmacokinetics are, su are sufficient. So going from this long-term cell survival assay, they went into preclinical animals, and they arrived at this vinyl cell phone compound called K777 that I said is going into safety pharmacology. But it's not a good paradigm for doing any kind of high-throughput drug discovery, because you start with a biochemical assay, and then your very next assay is quite laborious and long term. So to try to address this issue, we wanted to insert a cell-based assay that was a much shorter term assay, not as rigorous. We're looking now at inhibition of proliferation <clears throat> instead of looking at cytal activity. But we can do this much more quickly in 96 well or, or 384 well format. And our readout is going to be a high content analysis. So this high content assay, uh, which is a, a cell-based imaging assay, will provide a fast readout for proliferation. We can then compare that to this very well-validated assay to tell us if we, it's OK if some of these things don't work here, but it would be bad to filter compounds out if they didn't work here, but they would have worked here and in animal models. Then uh, if we have this assay and it's well-validated, we can incorporate it for secondary validation of compounds as we're going along this drug discovery pathway. We can also initiate high-throughput screening. This is now amenable for doing an entire whole parasite high-throughput screen, which has been challenging in the past. OK, so here's uh, just uh, what the assay format looks like and just a tiny bit of data about the assay format. This is, uh, so T. cruzi lives inside human cells. Uh, muscle cells, heart muscle cells, and also <clears throat> macrophage. So this is a, a T. cruzi that's infected in uh, epithelial cells. 
And here's just a nuclear stain. We have a nuclear, the stain of the mammalian cell nucleus. And then this bright stain, it's the same stain, but now we're staining kinetoplastid DNA. So this is very dense, uh, well-stained DNA in the parasite itself. And the instrument can very readily uh, automatically collect this data in 3D four well format, and then can tell you how many mammalian nuclei you have because there are stains of that size, and how many kinetoplastid DNAs you have, and therefore count number of mammalian cells and number of parasite cells. So one thing that's very nice about this assay, besides being fast and, and easy, is that you get a readout for toxicity at the same time that you're getting a readout for efficacy. So here we screened a library of drugs and drug-like compounds and obtained compounds such as flufenazine here, where uh, you see a dose-dependent loss of that kinetoplastid DNA and much less, you can see it's not as clean an assay, but much less loss of the mammalian cells. And interestingly, about 60% of the compounds that we identified in this screen were already in the literature for having some antiparasitic activity. This compound is an antipsychotic drug, and it in the literature had been shown to kill T. brucei, which is a, a related trypanosome. Okay, um, I think I'm just going to wrap it up here. But this is a structure of K77, that uh, compound that's going into IND enabling studies. Here's a crystal structure of that compound. This is a chemistry focused project to improve on the physical chemical properties of this compound by making it smaller and non peptidic. And a series of Medicinal chemistry studies uh, led to this compound, which is a somewhat more drug-like compound. Um, if anybody's interested, I can talk about vinyl cell phones and covalent modifiers as drugs later. But except for having the same warhead, this is a, a more drug-like compound and uh, more straightforward to synthesize. And very recently, the crystal structure of this compound came out. Linda Brynan is a crystallographer, runs the crystallography court at the Sandler Center. And you can see that it binds very similarly. Here, the non-peptidic compound is in yellow, and K77 is in purple. It maps out a very similar chemical, a very similar three-dimensional space in the protein. OK, I'm going to skip my, my worms. I just like that because worms are really gross, and that's cool. So just to wrap up, uh, by thanking the team that we work with. Uh, as people have noted throughout the day, drug discovery, even early lead discovery, is a multidisciplinary, multi-person process. And so here are the uh, members of the Small Molecule Discovery Center in Chemistry and Biology. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, so uh, the judges have uh, made a decision. So I'm, I'll start by introducing uh, David Mack to you. Um, and then they'll, they'll all uh, come up and say a few words about their decision process. Great. Uh, first of all, let, let me thank our hosts here and uh, having us come back yet another year to participate in this is always fun. And uh, for someone who's been involved with SEND since it was a concept with Jeff Owen, I'm just really excited to see, uh, you know, the quality of work that, that's coming out of the program and underscoring the importance of having a translational uh, approach to your biology uh, as it applies to emerging and neglected diseases. So, you know, thanks for that. And it was very clear from all, all three talks. Last year, um, and Edgar, congratulations, it's really terrific uh, progress, and it's exciting to see uh, from, uh, from your presentation last year to your progress today. Last year, uh, the audience picked Edgar, as did the panel of judges, um, and we flipped on the second and third. Uh, this year, we're going to break from uh, that tradition, and we're going against the audience this year. Um, and, you know, just... Uh, just to cut to the chase, uh, we, we went with Larissa. Congratulations. Um, and I have to say, it was, it was a very difficult, difficult uh, decision. Um, and, and remember that how we're approaching um, this project is from really a practical drug screening perspective. Um, so the importance of having a screen that is amenable to 100,000 compounds um, and secondary screens that are going to filter through uh, some of those hits is really critical to, to bear in mind. Um, 
And although my knee jerk was that the LP10 molecule looked like a pretty reasonable drug-like molecule, uh, I defer to Adam here, who is a chemist by training, and apparently there's metabolic uh, uh, liabilities to that particular molecule, so it'd be interesting to explore the pharmacopoeia of, of the target. But no, I think that's a, it, it looks like a, a very, very good uh, hit, and so it's something that's definitely worth following up. But I think one of the questions um, you know, we, we were certainly asking ourselves is that you had, and I think actually someone in the audience had it, asked the same thing, which is that's a great compound, but is there a need to keep on looking for other ones given that you have such a successful hit? And I think we decided that it's great to have one hit, but really it would be nice to have um, additional scaffolds to screen, and, and I think you answered that question. So there's, you're going to get, I think, a lot of valid information out of this, uh, out of this screen that you're going to do. And Kevin, you could yeah. comment on the screen itself. Yeah, I mean, you've already shown it, it will work. We, you know, we were making this decision, we were thinking, what is the most likely project to yield a, a, a drug-like compound in a year? And I think, you know, you have the uh, screen, and personally, I, I like the idea that you have crystallography as well that's going to that's gonna help you, probably not within this year, but that's going to help you um, optimize. And the fact that you have such a nice drug already <laughs> um, really we felt shouldn't work against you because uh, you, we, we know how easy it is for, for these compounds to fall, uh, fall through during the, the development process. So if I could say one more thing too. I, I think the, um, an important thing though to, to think about is you know, the way I'm guessing this molecule interacts is that the, the pyridine nitrogen is interacting with the heme. And you're going to see this with uh, all the P450 enzymes, which I, I think was also brought up. Um, so you're going to have to counter screen, obviously, against uh, the human enzymes. So that brings up the, the question of that's the, that's the key problem with posiconazole, itraconazole, fluconazole, ketoconazole, you know, all these, all drugs. So you, I think it's important to focus on what are the liabilities of those drugs and really proving that you're solving a problem with those drugs because these are pretty decent drugs. So, you know, focus really on finding the liability with those drugs that are out there and solving one of the key problems with them. Because I, you know, there are some food interaction problems with posiconazole and stuff, but it's not, they're, they're re relatively good drugs. So I think that's, a, that's something to think about too. So just to let the group know, um, you chose the CIP-51 project as number two. You chose the KSAHV project as number one. Uh, and Veronica, where, where are you? Oh, really outstanding presentation. Um, and the biology is really, really compelling. And the mechanism of action and the way that you're approaching it from a drug development perspective is, is really interesting and exciting. I guess I'll let Gideon really speak to some of the major concerns. And you heard some of this in the Q, uh, in, in the Q and A regarding the cell-based screen. Um, and I think Gideon could speak to that. Yeah, I just, um, I mean, we've wanted to make uh, successful drugs from cell-based screens for uh, as long as drug discovery's been around. And, and uh, of course, many of them have yielded, but in, the, in, in most drug discovery efforts now, we've, we've tended away from cell-based screens for some of the reasons that, that came up in the questions. Um, you're gonna get hits, and you're gonna get lots of hits. And, and really, the, the question is, how do you get from those lots of hits to the next, to the next, to, to the drug candidate? Well, given your expertise, I mean, how many hits given that Yeah, I would guess, you know, obviously it's, it depends on where you set the threshold, but you'll, you'll easily get a, a thousand hits out of a hundred thousand uh, molecule screen. And uh, it could take a long time to figure out. To, uh, well, I mean, that secondary screen is really elegant. I mean, I really like it, but for a thousand compounds, forget it. And just the, just the other side, um, the, the nice thing about getting, doing a cell-based screen is w when you get a hit, you know it will work in cells. The downside is that you're going to miss a lot of things that, that would have hit your target very well, but just didn't get into cells, and you could probably fix that with chemistry. So those are just some of our thoughts going after that. Yeah. Anything to add? Um, um, so what we would do is encourage you to um, maybe tighten up either a cell-based approach or have a more amenable secondary screen. 
um, the tire throughput, but you know, definitely work at it. And I think Larissa is the case in point that you know, coming back another round <laughs> can work for you. <laughs> Uh, and, and lastly, the, the TV project, um, you know, what, again, in, in some of the questions, the uh, challenges on the, on, on the assay in terms of threshold of what uh, a hit is to, to pursue was, was a, a major concern, um, and particularly given the complication of, of drug on top of, uh, you know, chemical hit. Uh, so that we felt just needed a little, a little more thought and, and, and tightening up. Um, you, again, the, this competition is, you know, you're screening tomorrow, you, you know, you're going to hit the ground running, so you really have to have that primary screen uh, um, ready, ready to go and, 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 and well thought out to go from hits to leads as quickly as possible. So, um, guys? Well, I guess, uh, um, yeah, for the, the TB um, approach, the other part I think would be helpful to, for us to understand too is a little bit more about the biological rationale, at least in the, in the presentation, and coming up forward why um, the data around the knockouts of the M MDRs and really bringing that forward and explaining the biology there. Um, and then I think understanding where other programs, uh, I think the question, the question was brought up, really where other people have gone wrong in tar targeting efflux pumps, both in cancer, I think, and also in the other, in the antibiotics, it's also been an approach that's been tried. And yeah, you know, the human cells have a number of uh, transporters uh, that, that, that move all sorts of different types of drugs around and understanding which ones you're gonna interfere with there and why or why not, there's a concern around that. It would be an important part, I think, to present and talk about a little bit um, and better understand. So it's, a, it's certainly a, a very valid approach as justified by the fact that a number of drug discovery efforts have targeted MDRs, so it's a great idea. But you know, talk a little bit about why um, people have failed in the past and how you, you, you think this is a different approach and it could be helpful. Just, just want to follow just quickly about the, the idea of this, you had a, you, the development of a compound that, that can only be used in combination with another, with another drug. So I think that's, that's been one of the reasons why the, the current um, multi-drug resistant um, efforts in, in, in cancer haven't been very successful because you really, you need to prove the, the, the safety of the compound on its own first in people. And, and then you need to show that it, it doesn't enhance the toxicity of, of the compound that's really going to do the, 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 the bulk of the action. And, you know, it's, you can look around. I mean, obviously, the, the, the HIV and, the, and also the, uh, the anti-infectives in general have, have been very good about figuring out how to do combinations of drugs. But just having spent most of, uh, of my work in, in cancer, there's still, it's still a, a, a big uphill climb to get combination studies to work. Well, Tom, thanks for having us again this year. And it, it, yeah, it was yeah. a terrific job, everyone. It was really outstanding. <laughs> All right, you can see we work our contestants and our judges very hard here. Um, we're running about 10, 15 minutes late, so let's uh, reconvene at 20 of, and uh, we'll start the uh, last two talks at that point. Thanks.